Greetings, uh, my name is Shane Jackson. Uh, that's uh, a name from my British side. I also carry the name uh, Ninewam and Salapam uh, from my Coast Salish side. I'm from the community of Seashelt. One poignant um, situation sort of came to mind uh, where I was, uh, I was fighting a uh, sentencing hearing or a sentencing order so we were trying to get it uh, uh, switched up and one of my colleagues uh, you know a fella uh, from one of the uh, communities here in BC uh, uh, decided he was going to come along with me uh, so anyways we uh, uh, we began the hearing we went into court the, the the judge came in, and it was just the two of us. Our clients didn't have to be there. Uh, just the nature of the of the hearing, uh, and we both stand up, and and uh, he looks at he looks at us, and he kind of looks at me, and I, you know I'm quite light skinned, and you know I, I I come from a British side as well as an Indigenous side. My uh, colleague. Uh, was quite dark-skinned, so uh, he was very, very visibly indigenous. So he looks at me, he looks at him, he looks at me, he looks at him, and uh, and he asks him to sit down because he'd like to speak with his lawyer. <laughs> wow, yeah, so it was a, a, a little bit awkward, and I, uh, you know, my only response was, uh, you know, I... I actually work with this guy, <laughs> you know, he's not my client, um, you know, which obviously caused a, l a little bit of a fluff in the, in the courtroom and uh, the judge was visibly uh, flustered uh, because obviously he, he'd known he'd made an, uh, an error based on, uh, say, uh, misjudgment. <laughs> so the hearing, the rest of the hearing went quite, quite well for us. I don't know, you know, if that was <laughs> based on uh, based on his, um, uh, I don't know, uh, feeling a little st uh, strange <laughs> over, over what had happened. But uh, in any event, that's, that's my story. And uh, hopefully bringing some of these stories to light uh, um, will perhaps change the way that people look at, uh, at uh, other uh, practitioners in the legal field. Um, thanks so much. <laughs>this first story happened to me when I was a very young lawyer and I was representing two hunters in a criminal trial in Duncan on the very first day that I appeared in court it was also the very first day that I'd ever appeared in court I arrived early and I was wearing a suit I was pulling along my big lawyers briefcase and as soon as I got into court I was approached by an RCMP officer who <clears throat> asked me if my spouse was present and if I needed protection from him. Um, so he thought that I was a victim of domestic violence in court to address that. So I explained, no, I'm a lawyer. And I proceeded on my way. And so then within two minutes of that, I was approached by the acting duty counsel who was in court that day and who asked whether or not I had representation or if I would like help dealing with my criminal matter that morning. Um, so what was interesting about these is that even though I was wearing a suit, even though I was carting that big lawyer briefcase, um, no one assumed that I was a lawyer. Everyone assumed that I was there either as a victim of violence or to face criminal charges. Because my practice brings me to a lot of different courthouses in BC, I've had a number of different experiences at different courthouses. On two occasions, I've been asked to leave the barrister's lounge by other lawyers. Uh, sometimes they do that nicely. I I'm sorry, perhaps you don't realize that this uh, is for lawyers only. and sometimes not so nicely um, being asked to leave this. This is a space for lawyers only. You're going to have to step out. Um, 
On a couple of other occasions, I have appeared in court on either a CFCSA or a criminal law file and been asked to step back from the bar when I went to stand where the other lawyers stand. Court staff on those occasions has assumed that I am not a lawyer, that I'm a client um, who just didn't know proper procedure. So they've gently said to me, you know, you're going to have to step back here. This area is for lawyers only. Um, you're going to have to speak to your lawyer. Please don't step up here. I find it very interesting how often it has happened that people have assumed um, as an Indigenous woman when I appear in court that I'm not there as a lawyer, that I'm there as a client of one system or the other. I think we need to do something about that. I was at Surrey Court Criminal Matter. I arrived early to the assigned courtroom to check in with the court clerk. As I was going up to check the list, the sheriff told me I was not permitted past the bar and I would have to wait for my lawyer. She assumed I was the defendant. When I appeared on a family matter in provincial court, I went to the front of the court and took a seat to wait for the judge to enter and for my matter to be called. I was asked to please step back and take a seat in the gallery until my name was called. It was assumed that I was a client rather than a lawyer. Visiting this incident is uncomfortable. The situation is very humiliating. I was a young lawyer, relatively new to the profession, and I was given the enormous honour of being appointed to act as supporting counsel on a major Aboriginal title case. It was exciting and I was so humbled to be part of such an important and significant part of history. I was at the downtown Vancouver courthouse and earlier that day a senior non-Aboriginal lawyer had taken me into the barrister's lounge. It seemed like a nice quiet place to work. On the break I decided to go to the lounge and catch up on emails. When I arrived at the lounge a young lawyer who happened to be walking past me stopped and asked me if I was a native court worker because the lounge was restricted to lawyers. Even though I was not doing anything wrong, I felt embarrassed to be there. I picked up my belongings and immediately left. I did not return to the lounge for the duration of the hearing and instead opted to work from the law courts restaurant or from a library um, workstation. I don't understand why that lawyer felt the need to single me out or make assumptions about my role. I'm exceptionally proud to be a member of the legal profession. It's a great honor that I hold in high regard. I'm not proud to say that I've experienced race-based assumptions and actions carried out by some members of our profession. My hope is that in sharing our experiences, we all become more aware and actively work to combat racism in our profession and in our daily lives. When I went into the barrister's lounge to get gowned for court in Vancouver, I was approached by another lawyer who asked, are you lost? Can I help you? This lounge is for lawyers only. I've been approached in the courtroom and asked whether I was the native court worker. I replied, no, I'm a native lawyer. Can I help you? I was meeting with colleagues on a project and I suggested the name of an Indigenous lawyer to join the team. One of the lawyers retorted, she's not a lawyer. I was shocked. He sounded so sure, like it was an absolute fact. I couldn't believe he was dismissing her so completely. I knew that she has an active practice. I said again, she is a lawyer. 
He said, no, she's not, not really. I said emphatically, yes, she is, and she was in law school the year before me. I was angry and stunned. He then said, yes, well, she may be a lawyer, but she's only a rainmaker because she's connected to First Nations. She doesn't really practice law, not the way we do. Unbelievable. When I was a newly called lawyer, I was asked to attend in the cells to do a bail hearing, and the Caucasian client got upset after I introduced myself as his legal representative for his hearing. He demanded a real lawyer. He was speaking so loudly that a sheriff knocked on the heavy door to ask if I was okay, to which I replied that I was, though I admit I was nervous. I advised the client that I was there to do my job, and I proceeded to prepare for the hearing. I did get him out on bail. I am not Indigenous, but I witnessed the situation while I was a student at UBC's First Nations Law Clinic. I was part of a student group of four Indigenous students and two white students. All of us were articled to an Indigenous lawyer and we provided legal services mostly to Indigenous clients in the downtown east side. Most of our appearances were at 222 Maine. We were usually wearing suits and dressed in court attire. The white students were never required to go through the metal detector at the courthouse. They were always directed through the lawyer's entrance. We were dismayed when it became clear that the Indigenous students were usually required to go through the metal detector even after the staff was notified that they're articled law students. One Indigenous student was required to go through the metal detector every time he was at the courthouse instead of being allowed to go through the lawyer's entrance. This was disrespectful to the articling student, but also confusing to his clients, who could see that the other lawyers and law students did not have to go through the extra security measures. Our principal talked to the court staff and was able to address this, but it only stopped after that intervention. It didn't stop when the law student consistently told them that he was an articling student. Uh, My name is Haley Quenquega Bruce. I am a Namgis Kwakwakwok. A woman from British Columbia and a practicing lawyer. I think I'm in a unique position insofar as uh, I don't appear to be obviously Indigenous, although I have been raised within my Indigenous community and have uh, went to law school with a number of uh, Indigenous uh, peers and um, have had the great honor of practicing law with a number of Indigenous uh, colleagues. I have to say, you know, I've never been subject to uh, the same subtle and not so subtle forms of uh, stereotyping and uh, such things that um, my Indigenous colleagues have, uh, based upon my appearance, obviously. And um, but what I have observed, uh, you know, some examples that I can think of are, um, you know, the almost automatic assumption that. Uh, if I'm attending court with an Indigenous colleague who's dressed in a suit, um, and to me obviously appears to be uh, a lawyer, um, there's an assumption that that person is my client. And, uh, you know, the interaction takes that form that, you know, I'm here to represent this person. And another, I suppose, is a, a, a frequent example of that is in my colleagues, my Indigenous colleagues' interactions with others at court. So if they ask them a question, if they ask the other, you know, courthouse staff or sheriff or, or someone that's not familiar with them and doesn't know them as a lawyer, um, that sometimes even other lawyers uh, will turn and give me the answer. Uh, they'll reply to me and, and respond to me and I haven't asked the question. I'm, I'm just there standing with them. Um, so those are, you know, uh, some pretty obvious uh, forms of uh, 
stereotyping, I think, I feel, uh, that continue to exist in our profession. They're troubling. Um, they're frequently shocking. Uh, but they're always, always disturbing to me, uh, to bear witness to. So I think, you know, we have some ways to go. We have more members, uh, Indigenous members, uh, joining the profession. Um, I think there are a lot of steps we can take, uh, this being one of them, to raise awareness, uh, to check ourselves, to check our assumptions. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Get like yes, sir. I had to travel to a courthouse in the interior for a tribunal hearing and needed to access the law library after hours to review tribunal decisions. When I asked the sheriff to arrange after hours access to the law library, the usual practice for lawyers who pay fees for the library, he refused to grant it to me, saying it was because I did not have a business card with me. I had my law society membership card with my name on it and government issued picture ID, my driver's license but he still insisted he could not be sure I was who I said I was and refused to grant access. The librarian was upset and called a local bencher who came to the courthouse to loan me his key for after hours access. As a newly called lawyer, I was excited to have recently moved home so that I could be closer to my son who was just at the cusp of entering high school. I had spent so much time away from him during my studies, as he had stayed with his grandparents in the North Okanagan during my academic years, that I was happy that I was finally able to return home and be present with him full time. Since I had relatively few leads in terms of securing a position with an existing law firm, particularly one that practiced in the area of Indigenous law, I decided it was best to make a go of it on my own as a sole practitioner. I was in the process of establishing my own practice, and one of the first things to do on the lengthy list that accompanies setting up your own practice was to go to the local courthouse and get an after-hours access card so that I could enter the library at all hours of the day. As a newly called lawyer and paying the fees that accompany our right to practice, I know that an apportionment of our professional fees go towards the courthouse library. My experience with courthouse library staff has always been wonderful, and I was looking forward to establishing my relationship with library staff at the local courthouse. The courthouse registry staff directed me to the sheriff's office so that I could get my access card in case I needed to be in the library after hours. Keep in mind, this is incredibly important to me at the time, given that I have an extremely limited resources and I can't afford subscription fees for many online legal tools available to the profession. I enter the sheriff's office and politely wait until the sheriff behind the desk is finished with his task at hand. After several minutes, I notice that the task at hand is most likely done, and then I realize that he's probably ignoring me willfully. Rude. I then ask him if he can help me and that I was directed by the registry staff to come see the sheriff's office to get my access card as I am a member of the bar. The sheriff I am dealing with looks at me skeptically and is unsure of what to do next. An older sheriff and presumably the one in charge, working at another desk, overhears the discussion and comes over to take over for the more junior sheriff. Already aware that racial bias may be present, it's Vernon after all, I also have government issued photo ID presented along with my Law Society ID card. The older sheriff looks at my Law Society card with my name and very clearly displayed expiry date. It's valid, newly valid, and at the time one of my most prized possessions indicative of my long journey to become a member of the profession. He then looks up at me and then shuffles my photo ID card, which is also valid. And of course, it's not expired either. This ain't my first rodeo. There I stand, proud young indigenous woman who has earned her right to belong to the profession, her right to appear in court, my professional fees going towards all hours access to the courthouse library. I have even made sure that I was wearing business casual clothing as I knew that I would be going into the courthouse to make this request. This is almost a rite of passage ceremony for me. I belong here, damn it. Presumably, he reviews both of my pieces of ID to ensure that they are valid, and then he will proceed to issue, albeit unwillingly, my access card to the courthouse. Nope. He looks at me, smug look on his face, then proceeds to pick up the phone and dial a number. Who the heck is he calling? 
I've shown government issued photo ID and my law society membership card that says I'm legit and waits as he just looks at me defiantly. This sheriff is calling the law society to make sure my membership is valid and that the card is truly legitimate. He is checking to see if I'm truly a member of the law society. Ugh. At this point, I fight back the tears and buckle down in my resolve to look at him defiantly as possible as he learns that yes, this young and beautiful, proud indigenous woman standing before him has completed every hoop that can be thrown at me to become a member of one of the most exclusive professions in the country. Damn rights, I am a lawyer. My eyes get slitty. I look down my nose at this near retirement age sheriff and get all huffy puffy, impatient and mustering up body language akin to those used to privilege. I saw it every day of my life while at law school. He hangs up the phone, tells the junior sheriff standing to the side watching all of this that yes, this person is a member in good standing of the law society and to issue me a card. He says nothing more and retreats to his desk situated in the basement of a small colonial courthouse in the North Okanagan. At this point, I'm so upset that I don't want the damn card anymore. But to prove my point, I waited patiently for the card to be issued to me. I am silent glaring at the sheriffs as they issue me my card, and I don't remember what I say, but I am as curt and professional as I can be, while I feel tears of equal parts of rage and embarrassment threaten to betray me. I receive my card, and I march myself out of the sheriff's office as regally as I can, as befitting any of the countless Silk Sequema matriarchs before me, and I march out of the courthouse straight to my car. I drive around the corner, and I pull over to park on the side of the street. I look down at the card for the first time, examining the piece of plastic that just caused me so much grief in the past half hour. I look down, tears in my eyes, remembering my recently departed Papa's words ringing my ears. Lawyer, lawyer, lawyer. My card is simple, it's white, and identifies me as Vern Visitor ID number, but flanked on the left-hand side in a gold bar is the word lawyer. Yes, I am. Ironically, to this day, I have never had to use the card, and I may unconsciously have avoided the Vernon Courthouse since then. But I carry this card alongside my other lawyer-issued cards to other courthouses, my Bar Association membership, and my current Law Society membership card, which strangely enough still does not have my photo on it. I carry it, always, to remind me that the hoops of the legal profession do not cease once you are a member. They may likely be present, hovering right beneath the surface for the entirety of your career. But that's okay. I am a Sikwekma woman. I am an advocate. I am a warrior. And I am a lawyer. During an articling interview, a managing partner said that Aboriginal women are breeders. When will you start pumping out babies and become useless to the firm? When I was a new lawyer, I was asked to provide a biography to a senior partner at the firm. And this biography was going to be presented at a luncheon that included members of the Victoria Bar Association. After I provided this biography, I was immediately called into their office and was asked if I actually wanted to have the fact that I worked at the Native Women's Association of Canada on my biography. And I asked, well, why is this an issue? And they explained that then everybody in the Victoria Bar would know that I'm Native. I further inquired to ask if this was going to be a problem, and they responded that they didn't know if this was going to be a problem or not. I responded back that I wanted the fact that I worked at the Native Women's Association of Canada in my biography and that I was very proud of my culture. My name is Nicole Bresser, I'm Métis, and I live and work in the Kwangan Territory. Thank you for listening to my story.